shall we pray? So, actually, wait, before before we open in prayer, I want to share with you guys a couple of things. Um, Jacob has been going through some health issues, and, and yesterday we were over there to try and help him with a couple of things. And while we were there, Elizabeth got into something, and uh, she woke up this morning, and her face was swollen, and Jacob said uh, one eye is almost swollen completely shut. But now Brittany is getting sick, and she feels dizzy and nauseated and very sleepy, so I don't know what they got into yesterday, uh, but, but they could use some prayer. And then in addition to that, um, Andrew Rains is a, a gentleman that lives in our community. I, I don't know. I'm sure I've met him, but I don't remember exactly where that was. He was in a motorcycle accident last night. He was life flighted to Fort Worth, uh, so his family could use some prayers. <clears throat> and then this one I was going to save till last. Uh, Brother Tim's here. Uh, Jared has a meeting tonight with the pastoral search committee. Uh, it was either at 5 o'clock or at 6 o'clock. The meeting was supposed to be. I don't remember which one it was. Uh, Jared's still only 19. Is that correct, Tim? So he turns 20 in October. So depending on how things go tonight at, at his meeting, he, he may or may not be very shortly an interim pastor at a, at a Southern Baptist church in our community and that is a lot of responsibility for a young man uh, so we need to pray for Jared uh, for God's guidance for his strength and for his his protection um, it's not easy to do ministry in the modern world I'll just say so if we could uh, bow our heads and pray for for the Hill family for the Rains family sorry I forgot to say yep Andrew Rains and uh, for Brother Jared. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I know we've only mentioned a couple, and I know that everyone in the world needs prayer, but these are the ones that we know, these are the ones that are connected to us in, in some small community way, dear God, and, and we're just praying that you would allow us to see you working to follow that path, dear God, and to touch these individuals in the most Christ-like way we possibly can to encourage them, to strengthen them, to help them along the path, regardless of what that path may be. Open our eyes, soften our hearts, and allow us, dear Lord, to be your hands and feet as we encounter everything that you've laid before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Ms. Krista? Every day.
So I enjoyed this morning's message. Oh, sorry. So so much I thought I would continue it uh, this afternoon. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14. We'll be in Matthew chapter 14 for the entire service. So if you would, please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. We will begin reading in verse 22. We should go all the way down through at, verse, at least verse 33. And then I've had a couple of weeks when I, I didn't do a Sunday night message. So I think we may actually get out early, I think. I was joking, Leland. Actually, I was. <laughs> Glad you picked up on that. Now you know we have to stay late. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 14. So we were talking this morning, and we were talking about storms, and we were talking about three different examples of storms in Scripture, and, and, and I, I really I enjoyed point three this morning. I really did, because it gives me a different perspective of many of the, the verses that I have read in the past, and, and because it gives me a different perspective, we're going back to probably the most traditional storm story there is in Scripture. This is the one that probably gets preached more than any other. I'm, I'm sure that I've covered it with you guys before, but tonight we're going to cover it with the perspective of... This morning's message, and we're going to think about it in a different way than I think we've probably ever contemplated it before. So uh, instead of tonight being a typical three-point message, I have two questions and one point. Uh, <clears throat> so as we go down through the questions, it's a little harder for us to have a question and an answer session because we do the videos. So uh, if you if you feel like answering, just speak loudly, and we might pick you up on the microphone. And if you don't speak loudly, then I might remember to repeat what it was you said. I'm not repeating you because I didn't hear you. I would be repeating you so that the video could pick it up. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not picking on anybody, even Leland. <clears throat> Before we begin tonight in Matthew chapter 14, Brother Virgil, would you mind opening us in a word of prayer, sir? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be at your house and inside. Father, hear your word. Lord. We lift up the ones that we uh, heard about earlier, Father, and Jared as well, Lord. He seeks your will, Father, to serve your church wherever it may be, Father. Be with him and the committee, Lord, as they seek your will to, to further your kingdom, Father. We ask you to put a bond in the word speak to see. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so uh, I almost included Matthew 14, 22 in this morning's message, but uh, I, I I had a a change of heart late last night and made some changes, some alterations to this morning's message. So this really ties in so well, basically because I had already worked it into the sermon to illustrate a particular point. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. I can't ask Rocky what page that is on because he's gone to check on his friend that was in the car accident. He has Miss Kayla with him. Uh, <clears throat> so they'll, they'll be checking on their friend and be reporting back to us later. We'll begin reading in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Anybody want to tell me what page it's on in their Bible? Okay, very good. We had several volunteers. That's just for the video. 1272, thank you. Did somebody say page 14? Oh. <laughs> Braxton has the New Testament. Very good. <laughs> thank you, Braxton. <clears throat> Uh, it's good to see the young people participate, so thank you very much, Braxton. All right, so Matthew chapter 14, we'll begin reading in verse 22. I have them all on, on, I put them all on slides for you when I went back and reviewed them. Some of the background had disappeared, so if we run into uh, something like that, just work with me here. We all have our Bibles, we can get through this. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away. So in, in, in Matthew chapter 14, we're starting in the middle of the section where we didn't begin at the, uh, the beginning of Matthew 14. In, in Matthew 14, 13, we have the feeding of the 5,000. So what we see here is that this is the end of one of Jesus' miracles recorded in Scripture. And, and after he completes a miracle, this is what he does. He takes all the disciples, he gathers them together, he puts them in a boat, and he says, you guys go ahead on over to the other side. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to make sure that everybody goes home, that everybody's okay. So in this particular 
particular instance, we see that Jesus is not getting in the boat the way he did this morning with the disciples, but he's putting the disciples in the boat and he's sending them on ahead of himself. And I like that particular mental picture because what we see in, in the life of a disciple is that sometimes God gives you a mission and he expects you to show some faith and then start moving forward with that mission. So in this instance, they're placed in the boat and he says, okay, you guys go on to the other side. And he says, I'm going to get rid of the multitudes. Continuing in verse 23. I'm going to be really excited because it's, it, it's, oh, sorry. I'm going to have to wait and see if I hit it twice. Okay. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. So what we see here is we see that Jesus has sent the disciples onto the other side of the lake and, and he has stayed behind and it says that he had stayed behind for a very specific reason. He was going to go up onto the mountain and he was going to pray. So when you pray, who are you praying to? This isn't one of the questions, by the way. This is just already getting excited. You're praying to God. So what we see here is we see that Jesus has sent the disciples on ahead of himself to go where they're supposed to go, to do what it is they're supposed to do, and he has stayed behind, and he is, he is taking some time out of his busy schedule, and he's going to spend some alone time with, let's just be honest, his Father, God. He's going to be spending some alone time with God, and he's going to spend some alone time in prayer. And I love where this is going, and, and don't get too far ahead of me, but in, in verse 24... But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, earlier this morning, we read out of Matthew chapter 8. We didn't read out of Matthew chapter 14. So if we're following a chronological order here, then we know something about the disciples being in a boat and the winds being contrary. Amen? They have some experience at this. This is not their first rodeo. They have been through this exact situation before. Only last time Jesus was with them when it was recorded in Scripture. This time they're on their own. So what we see here is that Jesus had put the disciples in the boat. And they're going across the water. And it seems like every time Jesus tells them to get into a boat, there's going to be some harsh winds, doesn't it? And we just look at those two passages like, I'm not so sure I want traveling instructions from Jesus at this point. But then Jesus stays behind, then he sends the multitudes away, and then he goes up on the mountain, and he's praying. So he's praying to God. So he's praying to God. The disciples are in the boat, out in the middle of the lake, and it says that the waves have started to be contrary. The wind was contrary. They were tossed by the waves. So they have some experience with harsh water. They do. In this particular instance, Jesus is not in the boat with them. What do you think that they should do? pray. Amen. So it, it was Jesus last time in the boat with them. He woke up and he, he, he challenged them for not having faith. He prayed and he calmed the wind and he calmed the, the, the seas and then everything was fine. Point number one, I'm sorry, question number one for tonight's message is that's pretty loud. I like that one. Thank you, Jill. What did we learn about storms this morning? So they're, they're going to come. So there, there were a couple of things we pointed out this morning. One was that when Jonah didn't do what God told him to do, God sent the storm. So we learned that this morning. We did we learn that sometimes God sends the storm. And then later we learned that he calmed the storm. And then finally, at the end of it, I tried to draw a comparison that was just going to stretch and challenge you, and that was, God is the storm. So here you have disciples of Jesus in a boat that have seen Jesus calm the storm before, and they should know at this particular point that they have been given the abilities that they have been given because they have already exercised and seen miracles done. So what you see is you see the disciples are in the boat, they're in a storm, and they don't seem to have learned anything from their previous experiences. Verse 25, I'll illustrate. For now it was the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went to them walking on the sea. I love this. You want to know why I love this? If we're thinking that God is the storm, Jesus was where? He was on the mountaintop. What was he doing? He was praying. What was he doing? He was spending time with his father. His father had already re revealed himself to Elijah in the wind and in the earthquake and in the fire. Well, he wasn't in those things. He was those things. 
So Jesus is on the mountaintop and he's praying. And then I, I, I like to picture this in my mind. And you might think I'm a little bit crazy here. But I actually picture Jesus and God walking together. So they had their time when they were alone and, and they were in prayer and, and they were there. And then Jesus, says, okay, I need to go down and catch up to the other guys now. And God says, okay, I'll go with you. How did he manifest himself? Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. They're in a boat. They're on the water. The sea is not very comfortable. They see what they believe is Jesus. They're not sure it's Jesus. So they go to the next best thing, a ghost. <laughs> How quickly we lose our faith, ladies and gentlemen, when we're challenged. This is actually what the disciples are showing us here. They just witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus put them in the boat and told them to where they were supposed to go. Now he's walking out to join them. It seems like he's kind of bringing his dad, too. I'm not trying to be disrespectful when I say that. I, I, you guys, my father died in a car accident when I was young. I, don't have, I have very few memories of my father. I would love to have a memory just walking with Dad. So when I think of Jesus here spending time alone in prayer, and God's already revealed himself to be the storm, to use the storm, to send the storm, to quiet the storm... And Jesus shows back up and the storm's there. I see unity in that. I see cohesion in it. I see a consistency in Scripture that sometimes when God shows up, He's bigger than our imaginations. And our imaginations are so small that the easiest way for Him to get our attention is with the storm. The disciples who had just witnessed Jesus' miracles of the feeding of the 5,000 got into the boat because he said to, or going to the other side of the, sh the lake because he said to. They run into some trouble, and the first thing they do is almost lose all of their religion. They don't actually believe that's Jesus. They think it's a ghost. So they cried out in fear. They're scared. They're in a boat. They've been in a boat before. The boat's taking on some water. They've been in a boat taking on water before. They've been in a boat taking on water before with Jesus, and he calmed the sea and the storms, and everything was okay. This time they're in a boat, they're taking on water, they see Jesus, and they still don't remember, hey, last time he took care of us, let's be all right. No, they're so upset, they're so concerned, they think it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I kind of wish I could be there. I wonder what they were saying. Like when you cry out in fear, like, is it just like, no offense, ladies, is it just that, ah! <laughs> Men do it too, Krista said, okay. Equal opportunity offender. Man, I don't mean to pick on you, but like, if, well, you're just scared, just go, ah! It doesn't, it doesn't, I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> do you ever wonder what did they cry out? I, I got to be honest, like sometimes, like really, truly, like if, if like something really goes wrong, the first thing I do is say, Jesus, which I think would be okay to cry out, especially if you see him walking towards you. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm going to get myself in trouble here theologically. Verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. I love there's an exclamation point there. Keep in mind, from Jesus' perspective, he was just with these guys. He had just worked a miracle. He had just fed 5,000 people. He walked them down to the boat. He said, get in the boat and go to the other side. He went to have some private time in prayer with God. And now he's walking with God to catch back up to them. And they're crying out in fear. And he says, be of good cheer. You ever been on a roller coaster and somebody said, man, that sure was fun. And you're like, I got to go to the bathroom really bad. Like, this is a complete and total opposite of what the disciples are displaying. They're not displaying that they're in good cheer. They're not thinking, man, these waves are cool. Let's see if we can get some bigger ones. They're not enjoying this in any context. They're crying out in fear, and Jesus' response to them is completely different from theirs. And did you ever wonder why? Like, he just got finished spending a long time with God. If God's the storm... He's walking with God to see the disciples. And he's saying, man, you guys are going to believe this. 
this is going to be great. I'm walking to catch up with you guys, and Dad said, hey, I'll go with you. So the storm keeps getting worse and worse. And Jesus is thinking, I'm bringing Dad. I'm bringing Dad to meet the boys. This is going to be great. And the boys are like, ah! It doesn't work, Chris. I tried. Okay. Chris is doubling down. Your brothers do it. Okay. <clears throat> do they need a mentor? Teach them not to scream like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking, Brandon. Thanks for saying it. Okay. I actually don't have a TV right now, so I haven't watched anything lately. <clears throat> uh, back, back to verse 27. Be of good cheer in the middle of a storm with your boat taking on water. And then he says, it is I, do not be afraid. How many times in Scripture does God tell us not to be afraid? There's one for every day of the year. 365 times in Scripture God tells us to fear not, to not be afraid. <clears throat> And verse 27 is one of those. He's walking on the water to catch up to the disciples. He, I, I'm guessing he's planning on getting in the boat because that's what he does. And do you understand the picture here? Jesus has just got finished having his quiet time with God. He's walking in the middle of the storm, and he's not concerned at all. But the disciples are. And the only difference that I can see from this particular story is that Jesus just had his quiet time with God. And, and that leads me to believe that if you have just left your quiet time with God, even though the rest of the world might be falling apart, you remember who's in control because you just had your quiet time. You just spent some time alone with the creator of the universe, and you understand that that boat taking on a little bit of water is not such a big deal. Jesus doesn't get excited and say, it's okay, guys, I'm coming. He doesn't get excited and say, hey, we're going to go ahead and get all that water out for you. Don't worry about it. The boat's going to be fine. He doesn't say anything to them about the boat or the water or the waves. He says, be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. There's your battle cry for the week. All week long, try and be of good cheer. And do not be afraid. All week long, try not to let the world falling apart get you down because you've spent some time alone with God and realize He's still in control. He was not surprised by anything on the news cycle ever. He was not scared by the outcome of any election ever. Be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. Question number two was already on the slide, but I already asked you, where had Jesus been? Spending time with God. From spending time with God, he delivers a message to his disciples of what? Not panic, not concern, not, oh, woe is me. He just got finished feeding the 5,000, sending the multitudes away, loading the disciples into a boat, sending them off, spending some time with God. He's walking out to meet the guys. The guys are so afraid. They think he's a ghost. They're crying out in fear. And he says, be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. What a powerful message for us to deliver to the rest of the world. What a powerful message for Jesus to walk calmly through the storm, look at the disciples, hear the fear in their voice, and then he says, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. What were they doing? They were crying out in fear. What is he telling them to do? The exact opposite of that. Yes, the world believes that it's okay to act a certain way. And the disciples had fallen right into place. Jesus shows up and he's like, oh, hold on, wait. And I, I love that this story tells the story from the perspective of the disciples. 
you ever want to hear the story from Jesus' perspective? It's like, I was just with them. We just worked this miracle. I put them in the boat. I told them all they had to do was go across the lake. That was it. I'll just go across the lake. Why are they getting so worked up about a little bit of water? He had already showed them last time the, 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 the boat started to take on some water. It was really no big deal. And yet here they are experiencing the stress of the world and responding to it as though they've never spent any time alone with God. And nowhere in this story does it say that Jesus comes out like, man, that wave looks kind of big. Maybe I should walk over here instead. No, there's no concern on Jesus' part for where the water is. There's no concern on Jesus' part for where the wind is blowing. The concern for Jesus is the disciples have sort of kind of lost their mind. Momentarily. Verse 28. And Peter, I love Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I love that. Lord, if it is you. Who else did he think was going to be walking around on the water? The ghost. <laughs> Completely contrary to anything that he had been taught by Jesus. It probably is not Jesus who works these miracles that I've seen over and over and over again. It's probably not the guy that just fed the 5,000 people that put us in the boat. It's probably not the guy that calmed the storm and the waves and the wind. It's probably not the guy that called me into his ministry forever and ever and ever. No, it's probably somebody I've never met before. It's some mean ghost that just stirring up the waters. I like to point that out because what Peter actually shows here, ladies and gentlemen, is not confidence but doubt. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, you have to give Peter some respect here. I think in the first time of recorded history, this is going to be someone in a boat that is sinking, actually asking, can I get out of the boat? <laughs> Remember, a few minutes ago, he was afraid because he thought it was a ghost and the boat was going to be sinking. And now, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. I love the illogic, crazy, human response that the disciples who walked with Jesus, ate with Jesus, slept with Jesus, talked with Jesus, were taught by Jesus, still... are completely human. If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Verse 29. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now I want you guys to think about this for just a second. We've all heard this story before. We know where we're about to go. But if God is the storm and Jesus is walking there with him, what you see here is an opportunity for Peter to walk out and meet with two of the three from our Trinity at exactly the same time. He has an opportunity to walk out being in the presence of both Jesus and God, being displayed in two separate... Manifestations is a great word, because I knew I was fixing to butcher that, so I appreciate you saving me there. Krista deserves a raise. <clears throat> Peter was getting out of the boat, and he was going to be walking towards manifestation of God and Jesus in the flesh. And look where he goes, verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to seek, sink, I'm sorry, he cried out saying, Lord, save me, exclamation point. He was walking towards God, and he's asking to be saved from walking towards God. 
I love the irony of that particular thought. I do. Because I don't think about it that way when I'm doing it, amen? But man, it sure is easy to pick on Peter. <laughs> But in reality, ladies and gentlemen, when God reaches out to us and he gives us a call in our life and he says, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to be. These are the things I want you to say. And we don't do those things. We are afraid for some particular reason and we draw back from those things. And then it seems like things are going the wrong way. We cry out to Jesus the same way Peter did. Peter was out of the boat walking on water, afraid of who he was walking to. The wind was boisterous. If we take the analogy from this morning, God sent the storm to get Jonah's attention. Jesus was alone with God praying, walking out onto the water, seems like he's got Peter's attention. If nobody else in the boat, he, got, he has Peter's attention. And he cries out because he starts to sink. Lord, save me! Exclamation point. From what? What is Peter actually afraid is fixing to happen here? In the presence of Jesus whom he was called by into the ministry of Christ, who, whom had seen the glorious miracles that God had performed, who had witnessed the miracles, the stories of the disciples that had come back when they were sent out. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. What was Peter actually afraid was fixing to happen? In the presence of God, he was sinking into the water. In the presence of God, he was so concerned with the wind being boisterous that he was so concerned that something bad was fixing to happen to him in the presence of God. In at least the manifestation of Jesus, or if you want to take the analogy from this morning, in the manifestation of the storm. And I can't answer the question, and I've thought about it. Like, what was Peter worried about? Logically, you want to say, well, he's probably worried about drowning. In the presence of God? Well, he was probably worried he couldn't take the next step. How'd you take the first one? Like, how did you say, okay, hey, if that is you, God, I want you to command me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And then he takes the first step out and he lands on the water and he keeps walking. But somehow he gets distracted from looking at Jesus. That somehow he forgets that it's Jesus that's called him. Somehow the wind is boisterous and that has distracted him from the presence of God whether in the manifestation of the storm or in the manifestation of Jesus, what we see here is that Peter was walking on water and now he's sinking in the presence of God. And he's afraid. And I don't know why. And it drives me crazy that I don't know why. You, you like to think, well, Claude, he got out of the boat and now he's sinking. Well, where did the faith go that got him out of the boat? Where did the faith go that let him take that first step? Where did that faith go that let him take that second step? How, how many steps was he out of the boat before he started to sink? How far away was he from Jesus before he started to sink? Why is it that if he believed that Jesus could save him, that he couldn't believe that he could go to Jesus? I don't know what got to Peter where he lost his mind for a second and was more concerned about the wind and less about being in the presence of God. And then I think about the number of times it happened to me. And I don't know why I do it either. But sometimes I get more concerned with the short term than the reality that God's in control. And I don't think I'm the only one. Amen? Nobody wants to agree to that? I've got to find some toes here. I'm not doing my job. 
But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. How many times have we been afraid because the wind was boisterous? How easy for us, for us is it to judge Peter because he crawled out of the boat. I mean, come on. Clearly that's on him. But what's the boat symbolic of? <laughs> is it the church? Was he fine as long as he was in the boat and it was sinking because he had his church there with him? But then when he crawled out of the boat, well, he was on his own, so now he's afraid? It's a different line of logic. I stopped preaching and started meddling. Was it his own strength? Because as long as he was in the boat, he was fine, and he knew that he'd be okay as long as he held on to something that floats, and then he gets out of the boat and he can no longer depend on his own strength because now there's nothing to hold on to? How many times have we been distracted by a boisterous wind and lost sight of a glorious God? And then I understand. It makes perfect sense. In the middle of my panic, it never seems rational to you. It doesn't. And in the middle of your panic, i got to be honest, it doesn't seem rational to me. But we do it fairly regular. We take our eyes off of a mansion built in glory And we get scared. But what is Jesus' response? Verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's verse 31 where he steps on my toes. So it's verse 31 that I want you to apply to your own personal life. So, so Peter cries out, and it says, immediately Jesus reached out. Jesus, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and he caught him. So he wasn't that far away from Jesus when, when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he started to sink and he was worried that he was going to die or drown or worse. Okay, so I didn't trip over him, but I did kick him. Sorry, Krista. <clears throat> He was close enough to Jesus that when he cried out, it says, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and he caught him. That's pretty darn close. Or let's just be honest, Jesus is super fast. Both of those could be true. Both of those are true. Because he is close. He's inside your heart. And he is fast. Because he knows your prayers before you utter them. And the question that Jesus had for Peter has to be one that we need to self-reflect and ask ourselves. O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why do we doubt? Why do we allow ourselves to be distracted by a boisterous wind and doubt? And I think that it's really important we ask ourselves that question to try and narrow it down to find out what your answer is because really and truly I think the point of the message here is not the storm. It was just a boisterous wind. The point of the message here is doubt. Peter, who knew Jesus, had doubt. Peter, who knew Jesus, cried out to Jesus, and Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and caught him. And after he stretched out his hand and he caught him, he asked Peter, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I love that question coming from Jesus. Because that gives me the assurance that Peter had no reason to doubt. After all, he had talked to Jesus. He had identified who he was. Jesus had said, come to me. Peter said, I'm coming. And then he starts moving in the right direction and got distracted by a little bit of wind. And 
And God's response to that, Jesus in, in Jesus in person's response to that is, Peter, why did you doubt? You know me. You, you saw the miracles. You have been with me. You know that we are working on a glorious outreach to the lost and dying world. And you still have so much to do. Why did you doubt? Church, we need to make sure that however we move forward, it is not in doubt. Verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Now we're back where we were this morning. They were in the boat. The boat was taking on water. They woke up Jesus, and Jesus woke up, and he calmed the wind, and he calmed the waves, and everything was fine. So now we are seeing that Jesus has continued to live up to his example by making sure that as long as you're in his will, you are protected. So he, they get back into the boat, and what happens? Everything's fine. Remember the question? Why did you doubt? You've been here before, Peter. You've been in the boat that was taking on water and that you knew I was there and you knew I had the ability to cry out to the wind and to cry out to the waves and they would obey me. Peter, why did you doubt? Church, why do we doubt? There's lots of reasons that we can point to. We really can. We can say, okay, well, you know what? Last year they told us we were all going to die. We didn't know how fast we were going to die, so we needed to close our doors and stay home and just let it happen. But when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not. I'm not saying people don't get sick and die. Don Warwick is no longer with us. I'm saying, why do we doubt our calling to fulfill the Great Commission when it's written for us in blood? Why do we allow our fear to curtail our outreach when it was written for us in blood? Why, why do we respond the way the world responds when we have a God that the world doesn't have? Verse 33. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Point number one for tonight's message was be calm in the storm. God is still in control. Is there a storm raging around in the world today? Absolutely. How are we going to respond to it? Defines, ladies and gentlemen, not us. Defines the God we serve. And I'm not standing up here saying that we shouldn't take precautions. You shouldn't be taking your vitamins. If you want to wear your mask, wear your mask. If you want to wear gloves, wear gloves. If you want to bathe in hand sanitizer, bathe in hand sanitizer. I'm not trying to tell you how to take care of yourself. But what I am saying is that God has clearly put a calling on this church to reach the lost and dying. To reach the lost and dying not just here but in all of the world. We claim to be the church of Jesus Christ. We need to be acting like we're the church of Jesus Christ. We need to be moving forward, not in fear, but in good cheer. Because that's the commandment that Jesus gave to the disciples in the boat when they thought the boat was sinking. We can look around and we can see that this world very clearly, if it was a boat, we would say, it's going down, buddy. <laughs> but in all reality, we're not going down with it. 
because we serve a risen Savior that says, be of good cheer and fear not. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us an opportunity to open Bibles, to read your word, to challenge our own hearts, dear God, to make sure that we're honoring you in all that we do. I pray, dear God, that you would lead us and guide us and direct us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would keep us safe from sickness, from crime, from disease. I pray, dear Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around us so that we can go out into a lost and dying world knowing that we are doing what you have called us to do with the assurance that you sent us out with good cheer and not fear. I pray, dear God, you would bring us back together on Wednesday night and allow us to enjoy our time in communion with you. Speak to us throughout the week and encourage us to continue in good cheer and with no fear. Amen.